all the goth DJs and twitch witches are hanging out on Thursday for the bad VHS rips, unblinking eyes, and fire by night. Thetans and Satans comes from an interest in the cult of Scientology, moral panics, Satanism, and how they set the tone for the extremist social media panics of today. We really earn our weird left Twitch badge with this show, watching the world go red light in reverse every Thursday at 9 p.m. Pacific on twitch.tv slash echoplexmedia. Find our full schedule at echoplexmedia.com. I want to enlist you to be part of the solution. Yeah, that's why we're here. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do the show live every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Pacific, except uh, on the rare occasion that we don't. And when that happens, we try to get a pre-record in and get it out to the podcast listeners anyway. Welcome podcast listeners. Uh, welcome uh, live viewers. If you are listening to this podcast and you've never watched it live, you check it out live. Uh, Twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. Once again, every Friday, 7.30 p.m. And you can, in fact, support this project at 
eplex.store. That's the preferred way. Um, there's a Patreon like subscription service there. Uh, if you're a Patreon user and don't feel like signing up for yet another service, I totally understand. Patreon.com slash Echoplex for that. I'm producer Dave. You can find me on your grinder grid. And this is the councilman as always. You can find me on Twitter if it's still there at T H E underscore councilman. Uh, and you can also find me in your backyard looking to claim a little bit of extra space for my yard through eminent domain. Mm-hmm. I'm checking out your property lines, bro. I've looked at the permit. I get those six inches for sure. When we redo the fence, I'm just letting you know, so I'm putting you on notice. Uh, good fences make good neighbors. Yes. And easements too. Um, we talked about that with our neighbors when we did a fence here, cause we're friendly with our, at least one side neighbors. Um, we, we talked about it like a little gate maybe at some point between our properties, but then we realized then we would actually like be kind of like obligated to socialize with each other if we had a gate. So <laughs> maybe, maybe another lifetime, who knows? And maybe, in, maybe in another lifetime. Exactly. So I guess let's, we got kind of a longer docket than usual. So let's hit it. What do we got for uh, leading off? Well, I figured, you know, it's pride month. So uh, the reason for the longer docket is just because I figured we, we do a lot of talking about losers on this show and we're going to get into a lot of losers later. So I figured we'd use some winners. So here's some winners. Hope, love, pride. Proudly presented by Pet Food Express and Broadway San Jose. Uh, All eyes will be on Miss San Francisco when beauty queens from across the state compete in the Miss California pageant next month. As Elizabeth Cook shows us, the first trans woman to represent the city will be fighting for much more than a crown. Number four, Monroe Lace. It's a moment Monroe Lace will never forget. Earlier this year, she was crowned Miss San Francisco. It felt like a dream because it's been a dream that I've had for years since I was a child. But she didn't just win the title. No, I miss San Francisco. I know that my impact is much greater than that. Monroe is the first transgender winner in the pageant's 99 year history. The crown and sash are more than just accessories. Every time I put on the sash, um, the weight of it reminds me of the weight of my job of the responsibility that I have to make a difference for young children. As part of her Miss San Francisco duties, Monroe visits a different elementary school in the city almost every day. Hi, everyone. Today, she's reading a book called Sparkle Boy to the fourth grade class at Tenderloin Community School. Mama went upstairs. It wasn't that long ago that Monroe wasn't sure if her own story would have a happy ending. So four years ago, I ran away from home and in the middle of the night I packed everything in a single suitcase um, because I'd rather be loved and homeless than be in a home that didn't love me. Monroe has lived in this SRO or single room occupancy for the past four years, the longest of all the other tenants. This beauty queen has seen firsthand the ugliest sides of the city. One of my neighbors overdosed Um, a few months ago and I think to me that really shows how important public safety is in the city and that's what my platform is. My story isn't unique. That's the unfortunate truth. There are so many other transgender women who have the same experiences I do and they are not as lucky. Those experiences help prepare her for what came after she won the title. I've gotten death threats. I've gotten really um, just mean comments about my appearance. Um, or the way that I look. Even though there are haters that, hateful comments that read those, that say those things, I also know that there is a trans kid out there or a victim out there who is reading that story as well and maybe not commenting, but are reading it and saying, I'm going to be okay. And that's what, I, that's what I'm reminded about. Later this summer, she will compete for Miss California. But in the eyes of fourth grader Camila Soberanis, she's already won. It was beautiful because I didn't care if she was like a boy or a girl who came in my class. And it was just like normal. Proving that some victories are more valuable than a crown. Oh, yeah, you're right. I forgot. (laughs) I forgot that I have my crown on my head. Monroe Lace is also an advocate for victims of crime and sexual assault. She plans to go to law school and hopes to become a prosecutor. 
Oh, I'm not sure about the ending of that, but whatever. Whatever. Maybe <laughs> maybe she could run the maybe she could run the SFDA's office and then get recalled. Shit. Exactly. She she could run for DA, get recalled, and then go work for UC Berkeley uh, in a think tank. Um, but hey, good on her. Uh, uh, really excited to see if she can take it all the way to the state, maybe the national. Uh, that would be fantastic for, for the Bay. Um, so I uh, want to celebrate something a little closer to home as well. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the drag brunch in San Jose. Yeah, they do it. Uh, they do it running up to uh, Silicon Valley Pride every year. Actually, when I so uh, when I was more yeah, involved in Silicon Valley Pride, it was like more or less required that I show up to all of these because that's where a lot of the planning for Silicon Valley Pride actually happened. I don't know if it's the nice. case still, but at least the volunteers and the people, like the people working on it, like when I was DJing and stuff, it was sort of it just they weren't like you have to go, but it was sort of like you have to go. Oh. Well, we're going to find out a little more about what's going on with it now uh, from, I think, Len Ramirez and KPIX. A big gathering in the South Bay to support the drag shows. In some states, there has been an effort to crack down on those shows. But as Len Ramirez reports, that wasn't the case in San Jose. Well, it is Pride Month, but in some ways it's Pride Month every month here at this location in San Jose on the first Sunday of every month for the... Dr oh, name the location. That's Sofa Market. That's like one of the only cool places in San Jose. Name the place. I'm, I'm sure they'll get to it like the, at the end of the story. And flamboyant, full of energy and fun. This is the Drag Brunch, which is held once a month at the Sofa Market in downtown San Jose. Tracks performers from throughout the Bay Area, including San Jose's own Alpha Andromeda, who also serves as the MC. It's fantastic being able to perform for an audience that keeps coming back. The event is put on by Silicon Valley Pride and attracts a boisterous crowd of mostly LGBTQ folks and supporters. But while some places around the country are banning drag shows and shielding children from it, several families brought their kids to this show, including Lonnie Bassett, who does social media for Silicon Valley Pride. Being able to take my daughter who is in there who loves seeing drag queens and she thinks this is the most fun thing to do on the planet and just expressing our love for life. Marissa and Jonas Gonzalez consider the drag brunch their family activity. 18-year-old Jonas is attracted to the drag community and could be a future performer, and she enjoys having the support of her mom. Being in this sort of scene, it helps me, like, you know, get used to the waters. But even during the lighthearted performance, there were a few moments to address some serious concerns. This year, I think the focus should be on queer and trans people are in danger. The Bay Area is generally more accepting, but even even here, performers say they do have to be cautious of the ever-present potential for a backlash. It is a lot to be a drag performer in 2023 where you have legislation being passed that is anti-drag, that uh, prohibits drag performers from performing in certain states. Performers say this is considered a safe space and the shows will go on. It may not be the same everywhere, but for this audience, that's entertainment. Hell yeah. Nice. I, I feel like, a, I mean, it's a great story. A really fun time, looks like. Uh, for me, I, I kind of missed something in the story, and that was, you know, uh, what kind of eggs do they offer at this brunch? Do they have multiple kinds of, like, uh, uh, carb? Like, do they have uh, muffins, toast, pancakes, waffles? Like, what kind of, what is the food looking like? Because I'm totally down with the, the performance, um, but I want to know what I'm eating while I'm watching uh, food, you know what I'm food had hasn't historically been great. You're not there really for the food. <clears throat> Although right. when they well, had it the, for a while, they were having it at the the the, the, the five points, and the food there mm -hmm. was real good. Yeah, that's so that's a good spot. Okay, well, fair enough. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely down for just the performance, but um, if if you can get in really nice, you know, eggs Benedict, and you know, a nice nice artisanal cupcake, uh, make makes it all the much more enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if y'all want. I I can meet you down there sometime. We we go. Let's do it. We'll bring Bad Baby. Um, so, uh, still leading off, but still in the in the Pride mode. And one more, uh, well, we'll see. Winner, uh, the, the San Francisco Public Library uh, has committed themselves to being the queerest library ever. That's a direct quote. So we're going to find out more about what the hell that might mean. 
The San Francisco Public Library is celebrating Pride Month with a number of programs and exhibits showcasing LGBTQ plus history. It now calls itself the queerest library ever, and we wanted to see if it lives That's up to the name. Statement. KTV's Christian Kafton has more on what the library has planned for the month of June. Libraries are known for being quiet, but this month, San Francisco's public library is living out loud, celebrating Pride Month with a series of programs and exhibits. Librarian Christina Mitra curates the Hormel LGBTQIA Center in the main library, highlighting important works. It's Hijab Butch Blues, which is a play off a classic lesbian book called Stone Butch Blues. She says libraries should reflect and serve their communities. So she says this month, Pride will be celebrated with activities for the young and old. We know that, you know, we're the public library, so literally anybody could walk through these doors. There is no precursor that you have to identify this way, look this way, be of this age, have this nationality, etc. And so we're really looking at making a collection that is accessible to all. For families, the library is kicking off a series of pride celebrations and drag story hours. Persia is one of the drag performers preparing for a month of story time reading. She says recent protests against drag performers reading to children have only redoubled her resolve. She says reading to children isn't aimed at recruiting anyone. Rather, she says, she is encouraging the kids to be their authentic selves, just as she is, no matter what others think. You're seeing this figure, me, drag performer, um, just live their true authentic self right in front of you. And by, like you said, by me being my true authentic self, I allow others or give others that space to do the same thing. For adults, the library that calls itself the queerest library ever will be holding screenings of LGBTQ films, talks, and is hosting art exhibits highlighting the city's LGBTQ story. Tania Lunsford Links is one of the artists who contributed, telling her uncle Rodney's story, a story he could not. It's the story of a gay black man forced to live a split life, hiding parts of himself from some members of his own family. He was born and raised here in San Francisco. He went to Balboa High School. He was like a straight A student. He was really upset if he got less than an A. Link says she hopes sharing his story will inspire others to look back and live their own lives openly, honestly, and with integrity. When I think about Pride, I think so much about honoring our elders and honoring the folks who came before us, um, but also like fighting like hell for the young folks so that they might be able to be elders too. San Francisco Public Library will be hosting Pride events throughout the month. And if you can't make it to the main library, they'll be hosting events at branch libraries throughout the city. We have a link to those events on our web links page. In San Francisco, Christian Kafton, KTVU, Fox 2 News. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, they have a web links page. That's awesome. Yeah, <clears throat> I'd be interested to <laughs> see what some of the art exhibits are and stuff there. Yeah, for sure. Um, I did notice that they were being really quiet, even though they were talking about uh, the library getting loud. But when they, <laughs> when <laughs> everyone mean, was talking, they're like, <laughs> yeah, they were using their library voice. That's cool. That's cool. And like, <clears throat> I think maybe a city like San Francisco, more people might use the library than maybe a place like San Jose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't know the the numbers. Um, San Jose gets pretty pretty good. I think six six million. I think usages or checkouts or something like that in san jose annually so not bad but yeah i, I imagine the san francisco library gets a lot of usage um so I, i'm sure that a, you know a lot of young people especially will be seeing those exhibits reading those books getting exposed to all of this and, and fantastic uh, help yeah. us all i think in the it long run looks looks good so <clears throat> strangely enough we had a uh, three good stories at the beginning of the show now we're going to move on into winners and losers where there usually aren't any winners. And if anybody does, does win, it just wasn't who you were rooting for. That's very true. And I think it's kind of true in the first story here. Um, I don't know if, uh, if you were aware of this, the, uh, the mock funeral that was held for uh, public transit in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Oh, no. Yeah. Well, the, the governor's budget uh, did not is not uh, very kind to public transit at this time. Um, it's not final yet. So uh, advocates for public transit decided they would uh, hold a protest as it, as is want um, and block up some streets in San Francisco. And this is how they did it sort of New Orleans style. 
last time you took BART or SF Muni? If it's been a while, you are not alone. That's why transit advocates in San Francisco today are urging state leaders to funnel money towards sustaining public transportation as agencies try to lure back passengers. But before all of that began today, a memorial for transit. NBC Bay Area's Chrissy Smith explains. We are gathering here today. Our friends from the East Bay have just arrived from their, mar their funeral march and rally. And we're going to gather here and march together in a funeral procession to Civic, Civic Center. Transit advocates gathered in San Francisco this afternoon and marched. We're having a, um, a funeral for public transit because the state has not provided enough funding to keep transit agencies afloat at the service levels that, that have, we have been running. They explain that during the pandemic, transit kept essential workers getting to work. The federal government stepped in with aid to help keep things going, but that money is running out. And transit ridership levels are not back to where they need to be to fill those funding operational gaps. So transit agencies need just a little bit more time, um, a year or two years, to um, to bring ridership back and figure out sustainable sources of funding. They gathered for a rally and talked about what's at stake with the proposed state budget. Near City Hall, elected leaders and others joined. Well, Muni is in better shape than BART is, but we still face a dire fiscal cliff in 2025. Uh, that number is $130 million, or the equivalent of about 20 Muni bus lines, uh, that we will either need to cut or find another way of funding in order to be able to continue maintaining those services. I am now more optimistic than I was that we will get this solved. And both houses of the legislature have said they want to solve this, and we now need to work it out with the governor. State Senator Scott Weiner addressed the crowd. We know how to solve this. This is solvable. We need about a billion dollars a year for five years. That is absolutely doable in the state budget, and we're going to keep fighting over the last week that we have to get this done. There was also discussion about going to the ballot in the future with a regional funding measure. Christy Smith, NBC Bay Area news people ain't gonna vote for the regional funding measure uh, not likely i mean i i mean i don't know the, i'd love to see the polling on it but we've voted for so many and voted on so many funding measures for transportation right local and otherwise i think people have absolutely have fatigue on that one um particularly here um in south bay where because of the stupidity of voters in and and racist white you know suburbanites in the you know, late 60s, early 70s, we don't have BART to begin with to San Jose. Um, because of that, you know, we've had to take, you know, at least four votes, I think, on funding measures just to get BART from Fremont to downtown San Jose, right? I don't see how folks are going to be really all excited about investing more, right? Simply because folks aren't taking it. If, I think a lot of folks are just arguing, well, then scrap it if folks aren't taking it. Um, both, and, but also that's most that's the folks who don't take it saying that, right? Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to your general voting populace, you know, non-writers outnumber writers. Yeah, and I mean, ridership has always been kind of, <clears throat> it's always been kind of funny uh, here in San Jose. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I mean, I've been here for a while, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like 1980 when I lived in San Francisco. <laughs> right. And, like, <clears throat> if you were going to try to leave, say you were trying to leave uh, the Castro to head uh, towards downtown at 3 p.m. on a Friday on Muni. You might as well walk. Yeah, right. <laughs> there were just so damn many people pouring right. into into the Castro Street uh, Muni, like underground. Oh, yeah, absolutely. For I whatever reason, they wanted totally to go. They wanted to head downtown for this, that, or the other reason. They wanted to hit yeah. BART to go somewhere. You know, people, right. <clears throat> people who work in that area were, you know, fairly privileged and were able to get off work a little bit early and it was just absolutely jam-packed from like 3 p.m to like 10 p.m you if you wanted it was just absolutely you know them them it wasn't quite like this but you know those uh videos you'd see of japan where they like are shoving people into the train right <laughs> it, yeah. it was except everybody was super nice because it was the castro right but then like <laughs> come about 10 30 10 or 10 30 now trying to leave trying to leave like Powell street or civic center to get p to the Castro to like go party or whatever uh, on Friday, Saturday night. It was, as it was, it was just absolute insanity. And, 
so I got here and there's just nobody on the train. <laughs> I'm just like, why yeah, are right. there nobody on the train? This is a very nice right. train. Why is no one on it? Very clean. Very, very smooth. Very quiet. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I could tell you, I know, I mean, we know exactly why I would San, San Jose, especially is a city and area that's just been built up around the car. Right. And, uh, part of California's obsession with our cars. Um, whereas San Francisco, and to some extent, Oakland are older cities, right? They're, they are, they've been around longer, more established as cities and in need of the transit options. Um, San Jose just was late getting on the bus, let's just say, <laughs> late hopping on the train. Um, and they're there now, but it's, it, it's you're right. I mean, the, the, the rail is coming, the, 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 sorry, the, the trains are coming, but the people aren't necessarily hopping on. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the timing of this was as as it is too, because Bart the extension mm -hmm. to San Jose is. <clears throat> I didn't. First of all, you remember when they were talking about it? I was like, "That's never going to happen." I don't know how many times I've heard, "Oh, Bart's going to San Jose." Like I've heard that yeah. since I was a kid, but they finally did it. I'm still kind of yeah. mad about where they put it, though. I'm like, what? sure, but like whatever, like whatever. There's yeah. a there's a uh, an express an express bus that goes basically it goes from a. Uh, 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 first in santa clara to the bart station i think it only stops three places in between too so it's almost like a shuttle but yeah i like <clears throat> i got on bart not too long ago to go visit my parents and i was like the only one on the car rough from Berryessa. yeah and it was yeah. it was still hot as hell in that car <laughs> like, i don't know they've never been able to air condition bart for some reason i think it's just oh. that i think it's just the, the i don't know there's anyway that's that's neither here nor there I hope they, I hope they get the money because like people need transit <clears throat> and like, you know, if there's no, no good transit and then like some kind of gas or like oil crisis hits or whatever, and people either gas is just, you know, so expensive that people are going to consider transit or maybe there's no gas for whatever reason, right? The, sure. the world's a complicated place and we <clears throat> get some of our, <clears throat> we get some of our oil from here, some of it from other places. <clears throat> and so you know, the stuff kind of needs to be there in the cities and, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see. Nothing sparks, nothing sparks change like necessity. Right. Um, and the comforts that we have and the privileges that we have, we're only going to realize them when I realize what we have, when people come to us and start wanting to fight us for them. Right. And, and when it becomes a commodity that's worth going to, you know, physical battle over, <laughs> I think that might be the point where we get, where we get there. But, um, in the meantime, uh, yeah, good. good on, I'm I'm glad that at least the people that made the decisions are trying to move us in the right direction. Whether or not the general populace is there yet, I don't know. But like and you I mean, said, if you make it more convenient, you make it you make it cheaper. You make it more convenient than using your car and clean, right? And efficient. People will will take it. I well, think. the the funny thing about that is <clears throat> the places where where transit is used a lot, basically L A L A and D C transit isn't particularly clean right it's just mm -hmm. it's just it just goes everywhere right right and, and it's that's, fast the efficiency is the is is i think it, it all i think the efficiency and the uh, expedience and the cost will you know get people over the squishiness about the cleanliness if that's their issue right um and like you've said before you can you can get a lot more done when you're riding in a train than you can while driving your car and you know <clears throat> and if if it's if it's convenient for you you don't even you don't get mad at the other drivers mm -hmm. you're not going to get in a car accident if you own a car you're going to put less wear and tear on your car mm -hmm. <clears throat> you're gonna yeah you're gonna buy tires less often just all those things that go you know the maintaining a car isn't ain't, it ain't free it's expensive and so no, you know if you yeah. if you grab a you know a pass for a pass for transit for a month or whatever and that's you know however much it is and now you're not spending that on your car i mean that that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Just the gas alone these days, honestly, it's worth it. Yeah, gas is pretty expensive, and it maintenance is. on the car is like it's just there's just a ton of advantages for drivers for for there to be good transit, and also like if more people yeah. are on transit, if you do have to drive, there's less people on the road in your way, so traffic's sure. going to be lighter too. You increase transit ridership by twenty, thirty percent, or whatever, you're going to decrease traffic by a non insignificant amount. True, um, and the roads get less wear and tear, right? Another problem with ma car maintenance is maintenance is the roads are worn out, right? There's potholes everywhere, and your car just gets goes through a lot more wear and tear in the day to day. So with less cars in the road, there's less wear and tear in the road, and so there's less ma maintenance having to go on. So everyone's saving money in the long run if we just 
get on the train. Even if you do it like in a hybrid way, right? Okay, fine. You, you know, oh, I have to do this, that, and the other thing after work. I need my car, right? Whatever, fine. On Tuesday, take your car. And on Mondays and the other days, like take the train. Try that. Or try one day, try one day a week taking the train at first if you don't take the train at all and see what happens. It, de- <clears throat> it all just depends. Like <clears throat> in San Francisco, that's easier than here, obviously. It depends on sure. where you live. Or take the bus. You know, take the bus. Try it. The, yeah. the express buses here are pretty, they're nice, they're clean. I've, I've ridden on them all myself. It's easy, it's, it's efficient. Got my clipper card, boom. So, anyway, we should move on. Yeah, this one, this one, this one, this this one, these people are, these people are assholes. It looks like people, people decided to film a a music video on the Bay Bridge, except they didn't like get permission or whatever. And didn't, none of the things that you, you could see like if a big, like if a famous musician wanted to have a shot of themselves on the Bay Bridge, they could arrange that shit. Oh, for sure. Uh, But I guess maybe if these people aren't famous, they can't arrange it anyway. But here's uh, some, they illegally shut down the Bay Bridge for a music video shoot. Fan fucking tastic. <laughs> it's not Drake. It has drivers fuming. It shows what appears to be a music video shoot over the weekend in the middle of the Bay Bridge. For many drivers who use the Bay Bridge, the images are unfortunate, but not exactly surprising. They're knuckleheads. They're causing all sorts of problems. It's going to create problems in the future. You get anybody out there that gets hurt. A CHP spokesperson tells us they are aware of this incident. Like, who is that? Under investigation, <laughs> but could not provide any more details. It's just the latest in a string of high-profile stunts that have turned the span into a parking lot. Like this sideshow back in February. In that case, investigators ultimately located the green Camaro at another sideshow and impounded the car for 30 days. It also triggered an investigation into the car's owner, who was arrested for allegedly stealing $20,000 worth of merchandise. The sideshows, videos, and stunts are a cause for concern for drivers like Andrea. And um, if they're going to do donuts or something, there's plenty of empty lots and fields to do all of that rather than hurting people trying to get to work to the hospital or police trying to get to Omar drives across the bridge every day for work and says he's been one of those drivers stuck in traffic during a sideshow. He hopes more can be done to limit these events. CHP points out while arrests aren't immediate, as we saw the February sideshow investigation, the videos provide clues that can help them track down drivers weeks or months later. I feel like eventually something should happen, like with maybe better cameras, trailers that could catch the digits of the license plates and things like that, track them down. Um, but yeah. Well, you may want that until they f- start tracking your license plate, buddy. Right. Maybe they'll get them down. Yeah. Papers, please. Papers. NBC, Barry, and News. Yeah, like people want that kind of stuff, right, because of these rare occasions where this happens. But if they put a bunch of cameras on the Bay Bridge, <clears throat> all of a sudden Palantir is probably tracking your location or something, right? right. Like. Oh yeah, and the ACLU steps in, and and every and everyone else bugs out, like oh, you know, the, my privacy. Uh, so yeah, you can't have it both ways when it comes down to it. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, and next time, guys, get a, get a permit for fuck's sake. I know you're not Jay Z or Drake or whatever, but you know, you can still go through the process and see if they'll give you a permit. You never know. Um, you might be able I to did, do. You might be able to do it in the middle of the night. Right, exactly. I, I like the cutaway, though, to the first guy. I just didn't know who the man on the street, right? But I didn't know what the hell his deal was. The guy who called them all knuckleheads. I, you know, I, I don't like what was his connection. I didn't understand how that guy came into the picture at all. Um, but, you know, good on good on the news for getting you know multiple opinions, at least and not relying strictly on that man's opinion. I like the one lady who's like, there's empty parking lots. Go do the shit in an empty parking lot. Yeah, right. Like, that's sort of my attitude. Like, there's plenty of places to go do your shit, like, that aren't going to disturb people. It's, it's, but then you realize, well, that's kind of part of their point is disturbing people. Like, they're deliberately trying well, to disturb I, the peace. I think that if it's for a music video, the point of it is to get a shot of them on the Bay Bridge because it's an iconic oh, landmark. That, that particular, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm speaking of the, the side shows, but yeah, I know that for that, absolutely, um, absolutely. And you see shots on there all the time. You know, commercials are shot on the Bay Bridge all the time. San Francisco has its own film commission, so you can there's someone you can apply to 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 get uh, rights. Um, and if you can't, like, go on the pedestrian walkway and shoot your fucking video. <laughs> yeah, there. Yeah, right there. Yeah, you can almost get almost the same. But I think the point of it. I think some of the point of it too is like, is the that it is illegal. Oh yeah, yeah. We are stopping traffic because we are the shit. 
I don't, I don't think this. I think it's more like fuck the man, not like fuck the people trying to get across the bridge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, they're. I mean, yeah, they. I'm sure they don't have anything against commuters or people doing their jobs or whatever at all. Yeah, it's just fuck. Yeah, exactly. Fuck the man. Look what we did. Oh, this next story. Song, this this next story is very, very, very much uh, as we call it down ballady, right? This is this, yeah. This is great. Couldn't so, avoid it. Uh, Safeway. First of all, classical music is nice. I would loiter more at the Safeway if there's classical music. I would hang out more often there if if I knew there was classical music. I'd just sit and I'd loiter and drink in front of the Safeway for the classical sure. music. But yeah, the sure. the the neighbors are fucking. The, all the neighbors are always fucking complaining. They're always neighbors are always complaining about everything everywhere. Well, I guarantee they were complaining about the the problem that this was trying to solve and address in the first place. Right. They were complaining about the loitering. Now they don't like the music. Correct. Correct. Anyway, let's um, let's hear more from uh, who is ABC yeah, about the what, what's been going down. Complaints are pouring in after residents in one San Francisco neighborhood are hearing classical music blaring throughout the night. According to the Chronicle, it's coming from a speaker in the parking lot of the Safeway on Webster Street near Geary. It's been playing that music since February, but now people are complaining about it. It's supposed to be... To Did you hear this tone? Look, this dude's tone. He, he, this dude's just like, this is the shittiest story. <laughs> but now people are complaining about it. It's supposed to be to deter... Thrones of winters, shade. But over the weekend, the volume went up and it stayed on overnight. A Safeway spokesperson says playing music is a, quote, common industry practice, but it's unclear why it's being played so loud and so late. <laughs> Either he's really dismissive of the whole thing and really wishes he could go home and eat like dinner, or he's throwing some serious shade at the neighbors. Or uh, I can't tell. <laughs> or he or he's actually mad about it because he lives in that kind of that very gentrified part of San Francisco. Sure. Yeah, and he could be like, maybe he's just tired from being up all night, having from listened the, to the, from the, the clearing, classic, classical classical music. Music. <laughs> the fugues, the fugues. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, this actually came, oddly enough, in San Jose, this came up when um, I was doing some labor for the city um, and a constituent had a concern about a 7-Eleven that was doing the same thing. Actually, they were blasting, um, I don't know if it was classical music, but it was certainly like ambient, like Brian Eno or something really just not you know, not, not much of a beat to it. Right. Um, uh, so uh, they were blasting that and the neighbors were obviously complaining, um, late at night, even though it had, it had somewhat gotten rid of their loitering problem, but it's, you know, it, you know, it's, it's one, you, you solve one problem, you create another one when, when you're doing shit like this, I would, I would hang out in the parking lot and pretend to be a conductor. <laughs> I'd get I'd get arrested for like they'd arrest me like thinking I was drunk in public or whatever, oh, and then I then yeah. I wouldn't. I, no, I'm like I'm not drunk, dude. I'm just weird, right? I mean, I'm sure you've seen like there's probably some unhoused folks that that come in and and you know might have some disturbances going on and are probably trying to conduct. I think they're conducting honestly the the music. It could could be entirely possible. Uh, the things that could be caught on security cameras, we'll never know. Uh, anyway, well that's that's winners and. Losers, um, mostly losers, obviously. Um, although I guess Beethoven's winning since he's getting played still. It's been like two hundred years since he died. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, that is that is pretty cool. What um, <clears throat> so who needs to get their shit together? San Jose police, but I mean that's kind of like constant, obviously, but particularly right now because there was a the the annual um, independent police auditor report came out um, just recently, and uh, it's not looking good as far as complaints against officers um but i think uh it's because we're getting a little more uh woke <laughs> just frankly we're, we're going to find out more an audit of the san jose police department shows complaints against officers have continued to rise over the last three years now this outside review was established in 2020 in the aftermath of george floyd's murder gateway south bay reporter la monica peters is live now for us tonight the hardest working person in local news and Absolutely. always just always just looking oh my god i mean i got a bad still of her but just looking Right. fantastic fantastic down ballot reporter of the year if we have awards i think uh, if LaMonica we ever should win the lifetime yeah. achievement award <laughs> if we ever do any down ballot awards lamonica peterson's just going to win all of them From yeah we'll give her a special recognition LaMonica. Yeah, this independent auditor reports directly to city council and simply provides them with the data. Now, San Jose police, as well as this local advocacy group, are talking about how they view the information. I think 
partially people are um, more likely to report a complaint than perhaps they were in the past because they see it not being addressed. Sandra Asher is a member of Sacred Hearts Showing Up for Racial Justice Committee and believes some of the data shows that San Jose police aren't doing enough to implement the hundreds of recommendations they've received over the last five years. It's like a two-year process to get them to, after we've recommended them, to even get them to start thinking and talking about implementing things. So just moving faster. According to the latest police improvements report, San Jose police have implemented about half of the 500 plus recommendations made by the Reimagining Public Safety Committee. Still, this year's independent audit shows that complaints against officers have continued to rise. In 2019, 289 officers received at least one complaint. In 2020, that number rose to 348. In 2022, 361 officers received at least one complaint. In 2021, the audit report only provided updates on the recommended police reforms and data was not provided for complaints. In response to this year's audit, San Jose police released this statement saying in part, the IPA report illustrates how the department is holding personnel accountable for conduct. The department's percentage of complaints received compared to total calls for service has increased 0.01 percent from 2021. So wait, they do have the numbers. Two. Ashley says an <clears throat> yes, in complaints but they didn't report them for some reason. From year to year means more involvement from local leadership is needed. I would like to see the city council um, step up and remember that they are uh, in charge, that the police officers union is not in charge, they are in charge and they need to mediate in good faith. Um, but I think we need to work, focus on a culture change. Wouldn't it have been great if she had just come and been like, you know what, fuck the police. But it also showed <laughs> that in 2020... She's very professional. She would never do that. ...had enough no. evidence to prove a misconduct. In 2022, 18% of those complaints had enough evidence to prove misconduct, which is a 6% increase over the year. Heather? All right, LaMonica Peters reporting live for us there with that information from uh, San Jose. Thank you, LaMonica. Yeah, like chat was saying, that's just the best scarf and eyeshadow combination that any news person is ever going to pull off, ever. Right. Especially local news, especially like uh, we all we're all very familiar on Down Ballot with local news and the quality, the caliber there. But uh, uh, yeah, the Monica just rocks it every time and brings facts. I just, you know, can't, she's just can't deny that <clears throat> she's in just bringing facts. She's in so many of these clips too. She's just wor working real hard. Fucking hell yeah! <clears throat> I, you know, I'm, what, I bet I, I bet she's probably you know just because of the state of local news more broadly she's probably not being compensated appropriately for the fucking bang up job she's doing either well I, they're, I, they're I, all I the anchors make all the money they're all looking to move up as it as it were um and so one day who knows maybe she'll be an anchor um, she's certainly earn, earning her way um but yeah there's a lot to unpack in this report and obviously complaints are complaints and whether or not they're sustained or there's even any follow-up on them right and, and any uh any actual uh you know punitive uh, response right or any sort of uh whatever they want to call it um uh, response to to the officers themselves it's it's generally not right um although those seem to be up as well too even though there's just not usually many complaints that are sustained especially by um you know because a lot of these complaints come to the ipa the ipa has no authority at least right now to do anything as far as um uh, demanding or directing change, right? They can just make recommendations to the council and the council has to act. Um, that's what some, one of the nice ladies was talking to the nice lady who should have been all like, fuck the police. Um, she, she, she was talking about, I mean, um, in private, so, you know, yeah, right. In private. Um, but the complaint, the complaints to come to IA, right. And it's IA, right. It's internal affairs, but it's like, you know, are they really, uh, doing their full due diligence to investigate their own? You know, who knows? It, it's just, there are usually not that many complaints that are sustained. I do think it's worth pointing out that 361 complaints, but that's not just complaints, that's officers who have received a complaint. That's like a third of the force, just FYI. Uh, it's a smaller force in San Jose than it probably could be, but um, a third of these folks in this small ass force are, have got received complaints. And could be as, it could be as simple as someone like just not liking a, uh, a cop. Sure. 
But really, like you're going to go through the process of filing a complaint if you just have a beef with someone, like especially if you're a person of color or someone who could be retaliated against in the community, right? Like, are you going to go through this whole process um, unless something really did happen? So I'm willing to buy it. And if a third of the officers in our city are facing complaints, even if whatever, only a handful of them actually are, you know, whatever, quote unquote, valid, right? Or are sustained. That still is, should be a signal that some, we're not doing something right, right? Like that many, that sheer volume of complaints. So a little bit of self-exploration and self-analysis would be, self-reflection would be really great from the police department. But they just seem to say like, well, you know, we accept the report and shit happens. <laughs> what I'd like to see actually <clears throat> is a little more granularity of the complaints, maybe triage them into like three categories, like least sure. serious moderately serious and extremely serious and that and would be being, you know that that or independent organization would be able to i i wouldn't i wouldn't be like i know what the parameters would be they seem <clears throat> that lady seemed like uh she I, I would trust her and her organization to set the parameters for the different levels or whatever you know because yeah. it would be interesting can... to know like what percentage of these complaints are police brutality right like because that's the right. highest level complaint right Right. Use of excessive use of force. Right. And to that point, the, the police auditor's report actually did point because it's an audit. Right. It actually did point out that um, the police department, I don't know if anyone was aware of this, when an officer points a gun, like points their points their weapon at an individual. Right. Not just unholsters it or grips it, but like actually points it at someone that they the don't word is consider brandishing. that brandishing. Right. Um, but like actually aiming it at someone. Um they don't, the police don't consider that in terms of their reporting and their record keeping, they don't consider that a use of force incident. They consider that some other sort of innocuous, um, you know, thing, right, in terms of their data collection. So that's just an, a small example of something that's, as far as the data goes, even with the data that they have and aren't sharing, it's just not comprehensive, right, because the police and the, and the union resist every possible attempt to really explore and examine what they do. Um, and the claim is always, well, we know better than you because we're the police. Well, it's like you weren't always police. You know, at one point you were just people and then you decided to go down this career path, right? And like, um, you know, I'm not an accountant, but I know enough <laughs> to know when my, my fucking taxes are fucked or when my finances are fucked, right? Like I know enough. Um, so, yeah, th there's there's got to be a... a and openness on all sides to change, but at this, at some point, like the lady said, the council has to step up and just be the and do their job. And be and, the boss, and lead, and be the boss. Exactly, be the boss. I say this about school boards. I say this about city councils. All the the lower, what are not lower, but the the lo more local jurisdictions. These folks forget that you are the boss. You can you can demand these things. You can make m motions and move things. You just got to do it and stop sitting around waiting for someone to tell you, give you permission, right? The staff is never going to give you permission. The staff, God bless their souls, and most of these agencies would rather not do any more work than they already have, um, but they'll do it because it's their job and they have, a, uh, they have a commitment, right? So if you tell them to do it, they'll do it. But if you don't tell them to do it, they're not going to suggest that, hey, give me more work. You know, no, who would, who would, right? <laughs> so you got to take, take the reins and just do it. Now it's time to move to Down Ballot Watch, where we cover stories that are explicitly local politics. There explicitly you go. local and state politics this week, actually. Correct. Although this has like a local tinge to a state issue, and it's actually nationally oriented, too. So um, do we need a little backstory before this one, or should we just watch it? I think we can just watch it. Pretty sure we can just watch it. There's pro The backstory is probably in this. this is a local, local gun shop owner uh, reacts to Gavin Newsom's proposal to amend the U.S. Constitution. Governor Newsom says it's time to try a new tactic to end the crisis of gun violence in our country. He's calling on the states to join him to adopt a 28th Amendment to use U.S. Constitution to tighten access to guns. Her ability to make a more perfect union is literally written into the Constitution. So today, I'm proposing the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution to do just that. So getting this amendment passed 
is a long shot. Congress would either have to pass the measure with two-thirds approval in both houses or the path that's never been used, which allows two-thirds of the state legislatures to call for a constitutional convention. Three-fourths would then need to ratify the amendment. And you can see the uphill battle when you look at how our country is divided with Republicans controlling more than half of the state's legislatures. But it's the strategy that Newsom wants to try. He's working with state lawmakers to make California the first state to call for the Constitutional Convention. Okay, so a big idea that's getting certainly a lot of reaction and once again raising Newsom's national profile. So Lauren Tom's joining us in studio. She's been talking to people on both sides. So obviously you're getting a lot of reaction. Yeah, Julian, it's a bold plan that has already received a lot of support from gun safety organizations, but not all think it can get enough backing to become a constitutional amendment. The proposal is modeled after existing regulations here in California, but I spoke with one local gun store owner who says restrictions are not the answer to solving gun violence nationwide. California is known for its tight gun control laws, and Armory owner John Parkin says oftentimes new gun control legislation brings a spike in sales. Every time a politician talks about doing something to take your Second Amendment away, unfortunately for some of you, you probably won't like it, but I make a lot more money because people come in and get worried about their Second Amendment and they come in and buy guns. Parkin is a Bay Area native and has run his Burlingame gun store for decades. He's no stranger to efforts by California politicians to restrict gun access. But he says the latest announcement from California Governor Gavin Newsom to propose a constitutional amendment restricting gun access is not only unsurprising, but set to fail. There's way too many states in this nation that, that value the Second Amendment, endorse the Second Amendment. Under the proposed amendment, the national minimum age to purchase a gun would raise from 18 to 21. It would also implement a waiting period for gun purchases, create universal background checks, and prevent civilians from purchasing assault weapons, all current restrictions in California. None of the laws that he's proposing has helped California at all. We still have our issues here, and the gun laws haven't changed it. But some believe it's enough to create real change. State Senator Ayesha Wahab is carrying the legislation in the state. A victim of gun violence herself, she says the proposal is written to protect the Second Amendment and appeal to states hesitant to change. Well, uh, some people will say that, you know, a common sense gun reform doesn't work, but I actually think that the data clearly shows otherwise. We, right? We are one of the most populous states in the country. We have a more diverse population. We do have gun owners. I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment, but at the same time, we need safeguards and guardrails um, when we're talking about uh, weapons that are designed specifically to kill people. In a Thursday morning announcement, Newsom cited the near record-breaking number of mass shootings the U.S. has seen this year as reason for the constitutional proposal, highlighting responses from conservative leaders who have vowed to protect gun rights. Say we can't stop domestic terrorism without violating the Second Amendment. And the thoughts and prayers are the best we can do. I'm here to say that's a lie. In this country, we do have the power, the power to change things, to reclaim our freedom from fear. But Parkin says it's not the guns that need restricting, but rather an expansion of mental health resources to ensure the people behind the trigger are using the weapon responsibly. The bottom line is no one wants to get shot with anything. Zero. Zilch. No one wants to get shot. Bullets don't matter. None of this stuff matters. You got to do something about the individual behind the trigger. If you take care of that problem, everything goes away. Again, the proposal needs at least 34 states to support it or two thirds majority in order to become a constitutional amendment, Juliet. All right, Lauren, we'll keep following this. Thank you for your report. All right, so the NRA called Newsom's proposal a publicity stunt that- So real quick, a constitutional convention is a terrible idea. Mm, it would be a fucking clusterfuck, even if, it could, even if they could pull off getting it. So you don't get to decide actually what you don't get to decide what the um what the topics of discussion are if you have a right. constitutional convention the outcome right well, I mean there I mean there there should be a lot of them right there should be it'd be more everything on the, is on the table and it would just it would I mean look at our fucking Congress if anyone who thinks in the Senate like if anyone thinks a convention of delegates could get shit done. Like, look at the Democratic convention, the Republican convention every year or every four years. Like, if you really think that would work, yeah, more you, power to you. The, see, like, the if... And uh, Gavin Newsom has to know this, that if you if if the, the enough states oh, agree to a constitutional convention, 
they could like they could just decide to repeal the first amendment or, or the yes, fifth no, amendment or the tenth oh, amendment yeah no he's let's let's be very very clear um the point that was made they buried the lead here which is that is trying to raise his national profile that's the entire point of this he he absolutely knows 100 percent this is never going to happen that this amendment will never happen that the constitutional convention would never happen that other states you know maybe he'll get a couple other governors to step up and say yeah i'll do it and he gets him a couple other news hits out of it but he's absolutely doing this just for the saying that he's going to do it and getting on the news for saying he wants to do it and he's he's just doubling down and throwing down as the guy who's going to run for president who's not afraid to take on the gun lobby he's he's putting him he's drawing that line in the sand um with this and with everything else he's doing um because he's really this issue especially he's really been pushing um the national profile on this so yeah he's just doing this for the the publicity it it is it is the nra is correct sorry but they're correct it is a publicity stunt um and uh you know the others uh, the others are correct too in that uh the the gun shop owner sorry is correct in that it'll go away and everyone will still have their guns and we'll still have the problems that we have because we also have a people we also have a problem of people and mental health in this country right um it's not just the access it's the people it's the, the folks that are getting access to these guns too so um so there it's funny that the losers are all right in this story um the losers from my perspective um but they're correct in this particular instance because he is you know gavin newsom he is a politician through and through and he's doing a very politician thing yeah he's running for president in 28 that's all this is is a correct. campaign ad for himself in 28 correct because he's got to do something because he's term he's terming out um i think in 26 so he'll have a couple of years where he's just not going to be governor or doing anything so for that run so he's got great timing if you want to run now it's great timing actually if you want to run for president i suppose yeah yeah especially right now when there's even some talk about you know biden's too old and should he run and that kind of thing right and is should kamala run and try and uh, usurp him but um but yeah no he'll be he's preparing himself very well for for 28 and he's uh i would say that he's delineating himself he's 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 already trying to draw contrast between himself and others um and that's Gen- usually that's the the most important thing when it comes to a, a really op- you know an open primary lots of people fighting for the the spot right from the same side um it's really about drawing contrast so he's the guy that's not afraid to take on the nra period that's what and that's what people and whether you like it or not right whether you're a rural democrat voter from the midwest or the south who's not so cool about that um or you're one of us in liberal west coast elite um and you think oh yeah it's great um I come down in the middle. I think it's a political stunt and I, I hold it against him. <laughs> Even though I, I agree that it's a, it's something we need to do and I'm not afraid to take on the NRA myself, but only on Twitter. Yeah. I mean, whatever he's going to run in 28. I, yeah, well, well, or maybe not. I mean, who knows? He might, some better offer might come along for him because running for president is actually, it actually kind of sucks. <laughs> so if, if he's Being like, well, if he's like, too. well, if he's like, well, look at all this money I'm getting from doing this other thing, maybe he won't run. Yeah, being president sucks too. Um, and then we'd have to hear all over again about how he fucked his best friend's wife, and it would just be just an embarrassing uh, a couple months. I mean, that's one of my favorite things about him. <laughs> yes, uh, <that's> anyway. what, <laughs> anywho, um, well, uh, shall we move on to yeah, let's a move on more stories in the in the down ballot space? Um, so, uh, San Jose, as you know, is dealing, and as we all are in California, dealing with a, a crisis of homelessness. And one of the tools in the tool shed of uh, confronting this crisis is uh, safe parking and allowing folks who are living in their RVs or their cars, um, and there are a lot of them, um, accepting that they are here. And instead of, uh, uh, you know, forcing them to just find a place on the street somewhere, um, giving them a space to call home in their RV. Um, but as you can imagine, the same, same neighbors who are upset because there's all sorts of RVs and encampments on our roads they're not so keen on having people parking their RVs in their neighborhood. I'm shocked. Let's learn more. In an effort to reduce homelessness and get broken down RVs off the street and into a safer setting, the San Jose City Council unanimously approved plans for a new safe parking site today. It's a proposal that already faced strong opposition from people in nearby neighborhoods, some who protested outside the entrance to City Hall before today's vote. Like right now, it's too close to a residential area. That's the problem. No, but you're, the thing they're describing is just a different residential area. Fuck you. 
RV parking it's where people lot are would allow like living. Eighty-five RVs to set up long term. But like they're show, like the news is doing a fucked up thing here too because they're showing. They're not showing like an RV park. Safety and right. want to know if the homeless living there would be screened. If all the neighbor neighbors in Do you screen all your neighbors? Opposing this plan. Lady, lady, go look at the Megan's List website for your neighborhood and then come talk to me again. <laughs> it, it means this is not a good plan. It'll be placed on a six-acre property at 1300 Berryessa Road, about a mile from the BART station. The city will lease the vacant lot from a developer for the next 10 years at a price of nearly $19 million. They are moving people from one place to another, like a musical chair, just this place. But, th th but this is for 10 years, dude. We're going to have security, uh, supportive services, and other things that the residents need. Councilman David Cohen proposed the property as an option as it is in his district, saying it used to be a truck depot, adding it's more than a mile and a half away from the nearest school. He argues it'll work better for everyone to bring the homeless parked on the street to this lot. But if we have a place where they can go and be stable, there would be no reason for them to move from place to place. This is an actually a solution that gives them an opportunity to have services and be, and be stable in one spot. Mayor Matt Mahan says it's a much needed solution, noting there are at least He's like, we'll know where to send Ed 209. <laughs> San Jose neighborhoods right now. We need change. We need to accelerate solutions and address unsheltered street homelessness. These kinds of interim solutions give us a pathway to doing that that works. With the approval, the city will move forward to set the area up, but there's no set date on when it will open. In San Jose, Ian Cole, NBC, Bay Area News. Sure. I mean, <clears throat> the, yeah. uh, they're going to have to build some infrastructure there for the RVs because RVs need uh, power. And uh, like, oh, yeah. so it depends. Some of them are going to have like bathrooms inside the RV. So they're going to need like places to drain the tank and stuff. But, uh, you know, this is yeah. this seems OK. This seems all right. It's, part, it's all part of the 19 million dollar price tag. So um, I think things do cost money, but that's a 10 year price tag so that's a pretty good deal i'd say over time uh, depending on how many people actually use the site um there have been issues with um safe parking sites um in the past where it just hasn't been they haven't been utilized as much um whether that's because uh the city and others don't do a good enough job of outreach and letting people know and then a huge part of it um so hopefully they're doing outreach around this as well to especially in the low in the neighborhood right around the site right so that you can alleviate um whatever concerns people have Anyway, like frankly speaking, I'm, it's never a safety thing for me, right? You could, I, uh, on our street, you could line up RVs as far as the eye can see, and I wouldn't be concerned about my personal safety. I'd be concerned about the folks having to live in these RVs, right? And and you know, what are their prospects, and how can I help them? Not so much about them, you know. I'm more worried about the guys speeding down my street and speeding through stop signs, running into me or baby, right? Um, not not so much the folks that are trying to find a place to live. Yeah. <clears throat> I've never, I've never thought like, uh, when I lived in Campbell right along, uh, Nido, there were a lot of, uh, RVs parked and I was never, it mm -hmm. never, I didn't even really think much of it. Yeah. No, it's, it's, just, I mean, it's some people, you, you, you're just the type that's going to notice that kind of thing. And it's just it, every little thing, you're, everything in the world irritates you. Um, and other people irritate you. Or you realize oh, people, that people irritate me all the time. Just not the people in the RVs. Not the people in the RVs. Exactly. You <laughs> realize you live in a city and you got to, you know, you got to roll with it and you, and people need some more respect and more, you know, dignity. And if we gave them that and we didn't treat them like criminals, maybe they, maybe they'd actually find their way out of uh, homelessness. So we're going to move on well, to some news about the, uh, soon to be, I believe, Las Vegas, uh, athletics, the Oakland days <laughs> currently. Well, it could be homeless days soon enough, so we'll, f we'll find out more though in this maybe story. They'll, maybe and, uh, they'll be living in an RV park. <laughs> yeah, this is a double hit, but we can go we can go pretty quickly through them. But uh, let's play the first clip. Sell the team! Oakland A's fans not going down without a fight and holding out hope that the deal in Nevada could still fall through. This is like urgency time for A's fans. The Oakland 68s, a nonprofit made up of diehard A's fans, is holding a reverse boycott at the next home game Tuesday night when the A's take on the Tampa Bay Rays, calling on fans to pack the stadium and raising enough money to hand out thousands of shirts to fans on Tuesday, which say the word sell, asking owner John Fisher to sell the team. What is the point of owning a major league franchise when you don't 
invest in it. While Chris Robbins, president of Save Oakland Sports and season ticket holder for the A's, says he's confident Tuesday night's game will sell out all 50,000 seats. And he's also holding out hope that the Las Vegas deal will fall apart, as Oakland has already lost both the Warriors and the Raiders. We're hoping that the, uh, you know, as a former teacher, right, we're hoping that the teachers went out and that the people in Nevada realize that you know, this guy's got $3 billion, that, that, meaning John Fisher, the A's owner, that uh, they need to focus on uh, giving public money and subsidy to, you know, the local community there um, and stop stealing our teams. This, while Congress member Barbara Lee, who represents Oakland, wrote a letter to the MLB commissioner on Wednesday, pushing Rob Manfred to reconsider MLB's involvement with the A's relocation process saying in part MLB's continued active encouragement of the A's abandonment of Oakland and the East Bay runs counter the rationale supporting MLB's century old exemption from federal antitrust law and Oakland Mayor Shang Tao standing united with Congresswoman Lee to keep the A's rooted in Oakland. And I know MLB has this great concept of wanting to diversify its, its fan base and so we need a baseball team, we deserve a baseball team, and we want the Oakland A's to be rooted here, whether it's with this current ownership or with the new ownership. She's kind of hinting something that we're all hoping for, which is to sell. And whether or not a sale happens, Golden State Warrior star Steph Curry is also coming to bat for the community of Oakland. Even when we when we left Oakland to, to San Francisco, I know it was a tough move, but we're still in the area and, and, and able to reach you know, the fan base that supported us so much. So uh, you hope they stay. That's, that's yeah. the answer. Um, yeah. Because you know how much it means to, to the community to have something to look forward to. I know Steph Curry buys all his cars on CarMax, and he isn't just being paid to wear that hat. <laughs> Absolutely. And he eats at Subway. <laughs> um, I don't nice. care. Um, the thing is, the, the Oakland Coliseum is falling apart, and the place where they wanted to build the, the stadium was, uh, was stupid. It was a harbor. Well, yeah, and, yeah, they were just they were just going to get in the way of the fucking port of Oakland. <laughs> it was like, hey, we're what, just going to get in your way. You know, at one point, like 15 years ago, the idea was Fremont, right? At the Auto Mall Parkway. They were, they were going to build a stadium for the A's out there. Because it's too was far just, from transit. It was just close. To, well, it, uh, the idea was that it was that BART was coming, um, but that it was just close enough to uh, Santa Clara County, but not in Santa Clara County. And the whole sticking point was that the Giants, the other team, uh, from the Bay Area had Major League Baseball had granted them territorial rights to Santa Clara County because they had thought about moving there at one point. And so the Giants were reluctant to let another let the A's move because they knew that if they did prevent it, that the A's would likely move out of town. And that would be the best thing for the Giants because then they'd have the Bay Area all to themselves, which is probably what they're looking at anyway. But there might be a reprieve coming uh, soon. But there's, an, so there's a quick hit about what's happening in Nevada um, as the A's are looking. This is up your alley about the public subsidy. The A's pitch to build a brand new ballpark on the Vegas Strip is stalled out for now. Nevada state senators were supposed to be talking about it in a special session today. Problem is, most of them didn't show up, and that was probably on purpose. Andrea Nakano has more on why A's fans who desperately want the team to stay here in Oakland are seeing just the tiniest sliver of hope. Many A's fans have been closely watching the special session in Nevada this late. Why do they just have her standing in front of a bunch of weeds? I don't know. Keeping the A's rooted in Oakland. Seeing that the assembly does not have a quorum, we will adjourn until Monday, June 12th at the hour of 9 a.m. The A struck out for now as 40 members of the Nevada <laughs> legislature... It's like a chemtrails conference in there. ...on a $380 million <laughs> subsidy bill to build a stadium in Las Vegas. This is kind of a 911 emergency call for A's fans I've been kind of referring to as to just rally together and just fight just to keep the A's in Oakland. Anson Consonaris is a member of the fan group Oakland 68. It's organizing a reverse boycott for next Tuesday to show just how much the green and gold means to Oakland and the fans. Yeah, we can we can cut off that. I think people heard more about this rally. Um, but that was the, the, the first part of it was the real story about the, <laughs> the postponement. So... so Yo, I'm not an expert on Las Vegas, but they don't really need the A's to draw in uh, entertainment bucks. So the A's, the A's owner going in there and telling them, oh, you need to help me pay for my stadium. They're like, fuck you. That's like the, well, the, 
the state of Nevada at least would is probably just gonna like think about like I don't they don't need it they just don't need it they Vegas is help. cracking yeah they did help the Raiders they did they did subsidize the Raiders stadium um when they moved down there and that's even less of an impact we're talking about like baseball 81 games a year you know um right in the strip that did there's there's something to be said. I mean, they could, I don't know what tourism is like in Vegas since the pandemic, but I'm sure that they're not like, you know, living at large as they used to be, but I'm sure they're not hurting either. And at the end of the day, it's one of the top tourist spots in the country. So yeah, I think you're right. Um, but again, I don't think they feel like it hurt, right? If the team wants to move there, it's more about the the team than anything else, right? So you're right. Like they, the team benefits more than the, the city does. So they shouldn't give away the farm, but a lot of times it's, it's the, it's greasing, it's the skid greasing and the, you know, the politician hand grabbing that really does all this and not need or de desire or public interest. Right. It's, it's sometimes just who knows people and who can get things approved. So, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is just anecdotal, but we're looking at maybe going to TwitchCon this year and, uh, mm -hmm. That's in that. October and um, it's in Vegas. It's in Vegas, and uh, my take is that tourism is doing just fine there, based on what I'm seeing when I'm looking for like accommodations and shit. <laughs> Tourism's doing just fine there. Just fine. Just fine. Well, just um, fine. Yeah. So I, I think yet to be seen. I'd love to see the numbers, but um, I'm guessing they're doing. They are doing great. Uh, so again, and you're right. I think the A's need them more than they need the A's. So uh, and there's plenty of other cities that would be happy to have a major league team too if the, if push came to shove um including san jose frankly so that ne you never know what happens in the future but no don't um, come to act don't come to don't come to san jose don't come to san oh, jose please. i know i yeah I, I if there was there was a chance that that would happen at one point too but no no longer going to happen don't worry we're, we're bringing google instead of a baseball stadium so much better also um, not the not the world's best idea but much better much better idea um, anyway, all right. Well, I heard the bad baby calling, so we should probably move on to our last story here in Down Ballot um, Watch. And uh, it's from Walnut Creek. Are you familiar with Walnut Creek, Bruce I, Dave? I am. I like Walnut Creek. It's like it's like uh, Campbell right, in a nice. lot of ways. Well, it looks like they, they're they cracking down like Campbell on uh, people who call into their meetings and, and get all crazy. So let's find out. ...by several callers making anti-Semitic comments. Officials say it seemed to be a coordinated effort Tuesday night during the public comment portion of the council meeting. One of the call oh, we lost a YouTube channel covering something similar in San Jose. ...defending yeah. white supremacist banners flown in the city of Walnut Creek last year. Mayor Cindy Silva interrupted that caller asked that person to be respectful, but when he kept going, council member Kevin Wilk said that call should be cut off. We take issue and will refute anybody that has hate speech or discrimination against anybody, whether it's anti-Semitism, anti-ethnicity, anti-racism against LGBTQ, it doesn't matter, we'll take issue with that. But people, of course, we want them to be able to speak at public comments as long as they're respectful and they follow the rules that the mayor outlines. The council member Wilk and the Walnut Creek City Council have been outspoken opposing anti-Semitism. Well, good. <laughs> thank, thank you for being on the record. <laughs> you know what? Oh good God. on the news there for not playing the call, by the way. Yes, absolutely. Or giving them any play whatsoever, really, right? That, that's, uh, I, I thought that was a good part of the, the clip. So it's good to see that they're cracking down, though. We've, we've watched enough live public comment, right, to know that um, it's just not worth elevating. Um, so we're going to move elevating. on to and another thing. Um, I see two here. Pick one. I think you know which one I was going to pick. And the oh, reason I'm on. picking this one is because there's also, um, off of the coast of uh, Europe, there are uh, orcas, killer whales, going after boats. So the, <laughs> I saw the good wife saw that she, she shared that story with me. I love it. Yeah. They uh, appear to have a ringleader and everything. So I feel like correct. this crow probably also heard about that on crow Twitter <laughs> and was like, well, if they can do it, so can we, the crow isn't um, really messing with boats, but it's like the crow's like, excuse me, this is my park. And uh, here, here's the local hit from uh, Fox Two, uh, KTVU Bay area. To attend visitors to Preservation Park in Oakland might want to be on alert. A pair of crows have been going after several people in just the past few days. KTVU's Alyssa Harrington spoke with witnesses. She joins us live tonight from Oakland with the story. The crows are nimby. 
Well, Mike, people say that these birds have been swooping, brushing against people, getting close to their faces, even attacking them. A letter even went out to tenants in the area warning them about these aggressive crows who are likely protecting their nests. Perched at the top of this towering pine tree. Uh, I wanted video of them dive bombing the news team. Birds witnesses say have been dive bombing people in the plaza for the past week. And a crow just kind of like swept past me and him. And I was just like, oh my goodness, this is going to get me. First, I saw <laughs> a couple of people uh, where the bird would swoop down near their head. And then um, the other day, I guess it was Tuesday, we got a notice from uh, the Preservation Park office, management office alerting tenants that there was a territorial crow. That crow has allegedly been blitzing people who get too close, like Pamela Birdman, who works in a building. Her name's Birdman. Birdman. With the U. I was like hit in the back of my head by something, and I had no clue what it was. Birdman said the impact it was, was bird so turd. strong, it knocked one of her earrings out. I turned around to go get the earring. <laughs> And then, bam, it hit me again on the top of my head. So then I was kind of scared, and I went away. And every time I go back there, I carry I went home. away. Spring and early summer. Run away. Season, Run away. So birds are likely protecting their nest. We also found a broken egg on a staircase just below uh -oh. the tree, although it's unknown if it came from the crow's nest. Okay, someone's channeling their inner tippy hedron, but it seems like it's legit. Uh... The folks even uh, who managed the park were saying that other folks have been attacked by the, the bird. The birds did not swoop us while we were there, but did seem oh. agitated by a drone someone had in the air. People who frequent preservation parks, <laughs> for now, they're doing their best to avoid the crows, even if that means taking the long way around. I'm kind of scared. Like, I get scared easily, so I think it might get me. I contacted Preservation Park and the employees there say they are aware of what's going on and one of them said he even had an encounter with the birds as well. Reporting live in Oakland, I'm Alyssa Harrington, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Yeah, I'd probably be bringing my umbrella as well. Oh no, that's the, the you, you would just piss off the bird with your umbrella. The bird would be yes. like, oh, Becky brought a weapon, did she? Yes. Crows are very territorial. Uh, but right over here, across the street from our house, we have uh, some ball fields, and I've certainly been jogging around those fields. And there's crows that uh, burst their nest in like the the backstops of the baseball fields, right? Um, and they will absolutely dive bomb you and swoop you if you get too close, if they feel like you're a threat at all to their nest. Um, so definitely keep an eye out for them crows. And they're just defending; they're just self defense. Um, so don't get mad. Don't hate the player. Hate the game. Also, the crows should have, the, the Ms. Birdman, uh, she's one of them. She's a bird person? Yeah, she, no, she's, a, she's a bird. A birdman. She's a bird man. Bird yeah, man, she, a bird. It's like, spelled like turd, but sounds like bird. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, um, you know, come on, crows, pick your battles, pick your battles. Seriously, find, find someone who's, you know, find lizard man or something. Anyway, well, uh, you want to read us out, Professor Dave? Yeah, I'll actually read us out for a change here. Let's, let's do it. This is uh, this has been down ballot. We do the show live every was it Friday at seven thirty p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. You yeah. can support this project at Eplex Store and at uh, Echo or Patreon com slash Echoplex. Live viewers, stick around. We have a uh, down ballot this evening. We'll be watching the Plandemic Three movie, and joining me in studio to for this will be Patty K of the Ruffies. Ooh, very fun. So. Thanks for, thanks for joining me, everybody. Thanks for uh, hanging out this week, Councilman. I'll see you next Friday. This is Audible Smoke Signal. This song is called Locals, and I'm about to change the color of all the lights in here and uh, possibly pour myself a cocktail. Peace out. <laughs> to get the party started.
party Pick up my phone just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice for the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car just to get to where they are Here at the local scene is where I plant my feet It's where I smoke my cigarette and I hold my drink I look at all my friends, they're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage waiting for MTV Where are those guys who's standing next to me With a pipe in his hand ready to blaze for me About five minutes later we're all singing We never get the fuck up on stage man like the scene We want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, what we wanna do, and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Enjoy that band. I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car to smoke another one what? and another one. Woo! Now just when the magic starts kicking in I hear we left playing and you know now it's time to head in Alright everybody now it's time to grab a new drink Spark it if you got it and then pass it to me yeah. We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want What we want to do And what we want is to jam So sit back and The joint now who's got my light A stoner E of course Shouldn't you be inside I'm all up in this bitch Being who I gotta be I'm fucked up like the US economy The truth is is that I don't think logically Stoner E take you on a psychedelic odyssey Now inside motherfuckers is rocking me And outside shit we smoke a lot of rockin' me Rockin' the rollie or the sexy girl be jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck but don't probably do a slap on me We do what we want and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. We do what we want, what we want to do, and what we want is to jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. Can't get enough Echoplex and want to keep the conversation going with the hosts and community when we're not live? Then join our Discord server at discord.me slash Echoplex. We have text channels, voice channels, meme repositories, and a whole section of screenshots that we don't even remember where they came from. Come join the Now Space on Discord at discord.me slash Echoplex.